Welcome to Private Equity Profits. Clifford Locks is a certified board of director, a trusted confidant to CEOs, C-level exec, and high potential employees to help them clarify goals, unlock their potential, and create actionable strategic plans. Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your portfolio companies with direct response marketing. He is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination LLC, and he is an eight-time best-selling author who has been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes Inc., CBS Money Watch, and many more. Cliff and Seth interview top players in the financial sector, focusing on private equity firms, venture capital companies, and family offices, discussing developments and trends shaping the industry. These experts will share with you how they've grown their businesses and increased profit, and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Cliff Locks. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. I'm Cliff Locks, your host. Today's guest is Brian Ritchie, the CEO of Simba Chain. Simba Chain is short for the Simple Blockchain Applications. It's committed to delivering a simple, accessible blockchain solution. This is going to be a great conversation. Stay with us. Even if you're not familiar with the blockchain, you're going to learn a tremendous amount of information. Brian Ritchie spent 30 years in technology and software innovation industry, recently took on the role of the CEO of Simba Chain via the Idea Center at the University of Notre Dame, where he served as the CEO and head of the investment committee for the Pit Road Fund. Prior to that, he ran the commercialization and startup at the University of Utah and Michigan State University. Helping launch more than 600 startups, he's a serial entrepreneur and a startup venture de-risking expert. Brian, thanks for being on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's good to be uh, with you. It's a privilege. Tell us about your background and how you ended up in the tech sphere. <laughs> well, I started the tech sphere actually uh, 30 years or more ago. Started with a company uh, called uh, Century Software, worked for Novell and U.S. Robotics and 3Com and started my own company a couple of times and exited and was deep into that space in the early days of networking. Mm -hmm. um, and then went back, got my PhD and taught at Michigan State for a number of years, as you mentioned, and then really got into this deep tech commercialization, this what we call de-risking of technologies, where we could take intellectual property and de-risk it to the market. And uh, we're very successful in starting a large number of companies and had a large number of exits. Uh, we had 16 in just the University of Utah alone, three IPOs, and, and then did that again at the University of Notre Dame with another 150 startups. Um, so I've kind of been both operator, CEO, mm -hmm. I've been investor, I've been the de-risking, startup studio um, lead, and uh, now I've kind of gotten full circle and come back to leading the company as the CEO. It's very exciting. You've been on both sides of the table and multiple exits, IPOs, sales. So you bring a, a tremendous amount of expertise to our conversation here. I appreciate that. What specifically drew you into the blockchain technology? Well, when you're as old as I am and you've done this for as long as I've done it, you start to see patterns in these trends. And I got to tell you that right now reminds me of the year 2000, um, almost, you know, they say that History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes in a big way. And, and right now we've got some a large amount of rhyming going on. And for those of you that can remember that period of time, you know, you had a huge hype cycle with a lot of companies saying, oh, the internet, it's going to be the next great thing. And all these companies would put an E in front of their name and a dot com behind their name, and then they'd go out and try to make it work. But but what was lacking was the infrastructure. And so you had this huge hype bubble that burst. But then you had some companies that really got to the solid foundation, the core principles behind that um, transformation. And that was the birth of Yahoo and Google and, and uh, you know, Amazon and so many other of these companies that have come out of that. I see that replaying again right now. So we have this huge hype cycle around NFTs and crypto and all of these other aspects of blockchain. But what people don't realize is that's just such a small component of what the blockchain can do. And I really believe that we're on the cusp of another major revolution and transformation technically. And so when I saw that, I said, you know what, it, this is an industry I wanna be in and I wanna be in with a, an infrastructure company that is building out the means by whereby other companies can take advantage of, of this change that's coming. Your foresights are extremely important. 
And I agree with your vision of where we're heading at this point and the blockchain playing a major role. And we'll get into, you know, at one point we'll talk more about the crypto community and how it's not tied to the blockchain. And I think our listeners are very interested in learning about that. What are your basics regarding blockchain? Talk to us about the users can implement decentralized applications. Yeah, this is really interesting. Back when I was first getting started in networking, there was a lot of talk about the value of peer-to-peer networking. And that's where it all started. But what we learned pretty quickly was we couldn't trust a peer-to-peer network. We needed a a central um, entity that would validate these transactions. And so that thus was born client-server networking and then went to cloud-based networking. The whole idea there was that there would be a trusted intermediary. So right now we use companies like Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services or Google or others to say, you know, serve me up the data and validate that those data are accurate. Blockchain is going to eliminate that intermediary. It's going to come back to the core promise of peer-to-peer and what we call a trustless environment. So anywhere that there's an intermediary that you are paying to validate data, that's going to go away and it will all be done with smart contracts. It'll all be done in computers where they will validate the data based on the decentralized community that verifies what's happening in the transactions in that network. So that actually promises huge changes back to what we thought the peer-to-peer networking would be. So for example, Cliff, if you and I wanted to exchange um, money on a transaction, right now we'd say, hey, let's let Venmo do it or let's let our bank do it. Well, those are trusted intermediaries. The blockchain will allow us to just do it directly. So we'll eliminate all of that other interaction, all those costs, fees, time, all of that will be done now on a trustless. We call it's ironic, it's really trusted, but it's a trustless environment where we don't have to trust an intermediary anymore yeah. to do that work. One of our prior guests last week was the Asian banker, and he's trying to educate the CEOs and chairmen of major banks in Asia at this point. It is a wake-up call where we're heading and the blockchain is the foundation to be able totally. to make this happen. And what are the challenges and pitfalls associated with the blockchain technology and how do we overcome them? Yeah, there's, so first of all, it's just developing in blockchain right now is just really hard because, you know, we're early uh, and like any early technology, there are a lot of questions. Which blockchain should I build on? Yeah. You know, how do I build on a blockchain? I mean, I need now, I got to hire a solidity coder. I've got to have someone who understands the hash structures on each individual network. Um, I've got to understand how to run a decentralized community. There's just a lot of complexity and a lot of things that need to be understood in order to open up the benefits that come with that Web3 environment. So part of the pitfalls there are not unlike other early technologies, like which should we use? How do we build on it? What are the right skill sets I need? How do I really make sure that I'm you know, getting to where I need to go to solve my problems? Um, so it's in those sense, it's it's not unlike you would think of with new technologies, but that's where I think uh, companies like Simba might really help. Mm-hmm. Tell us how Simba Chain simplifies the complex task of interfacing with web applications with a number of different blockchains. Yeah, so one of the things we did is we realized that, you know, you're going to have a lot of these companies that build these layer one blockchains. Sure. But then on top of that, it would be really great if you could create a decentralized, but also API-driven development platform that would allow you to build for any blockchain. And then tomorrow, if you wanted to change that, it could easily be changed to be supportive of another blockchain. So let's say today I choose a blockchain I want to build for, and tomorrow I want to change to another chain. If you built on Simba, it's one API call difference. And if you built on one chain and you decide to build on another chain, all the data from all those chains that you put on are still exposed to a single interface. So now it does, it's almost seamless. You, you don't even know that you've done it on multiple chains because you've abstracted to a layer where it's all available. So Simba just gives you your optionality, your flexibility. Mm-hmm. You can do this in a, in a very web two development environment. You don't have to have specific web three skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so your existing dev team can build out your solutions. So you get all the upside of web three with none of the downside of the complexity. Impressive. And I may be one of your customers. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a whole team uh, working in the metaverse at this point, you know, Web3. Oh, yeah. Uh, that would be exactly where we could yeah. really help. 
we're building out some consoles and tremendous amount of uh, dialing up and dialing down the GPUs and power that's available to our users. It's pretty exciting what's going on. You believe that the Simba chain is an anomaly among the blockchain startups. Can you speak to that? Yeah, there's a couple of things that we're doing really differently than a lot of other Web3 companies. A lot of Web3 companies are starting on the developer side where they're saying, we're going to create tools for the Web3 developer. Okay. We said, we're going to develop tools for the Web2 developer. We're going to be the bridge between Web2 and Web3 for the organizations that aren't going to necessarily be Web3 native, but want to take advantage of the Web3 capabilities. So think of any big enterprise. I mean, just pick one off the top of your head like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is not going to get rid of all of its stuff that is done in the cloud, but it might want to take advantage of Web3. So they need a tool that can bridge between what they've done in Web2 to what they want to do in Web3. So we've taken that enterprise top-down focus mm -hmm. to have an enterprise-ready solution that allows these big organizations to quickly, efficiently, and effectively integrate Web3 into their current systems to solve real-world business problems. And I think that's why you know the government We've got applications with the DOD, with Navy, Excellent. Air Force, with Boeing, um, with Mantech, with Tokes. I mean, all of these are big organizations that need a real enterprise solution. That's very different from the way most Web3 companies have gone about this. I agree with you. Those are formable prospects and clients that you have then. Yeah. You know, that'll give some comfort to our uh, listeners at this point as we go into the next question. What is your vision for positioning Simba Chain for a Series B fundraise? Yeah, we are really growing the company from a, a first principles um, perspective. In other words, this is all about traction. It's all about getting the right customers on board, scaling an enterprise solution, mm -hmm. and really being the go-to for that company. And, you know, right now we're working with, you know, a lot of really big players, uh, SI players. We're talking to Accenture and Deloitte and Capgemini and Booz Allen. And we already have a number of implementations with several of those players. Uh, we're talking to big companies that you would you would know of like Boeing and Fujitsu and Raytheon and Spirit. Um, these are all companies that are interested in building out real applications, supply chain track and trace, asset management, information management, identities and certifications. All of these are things that are being done now in the blockchain. It's interesting because, Cliff, a lot of people think about, they hear blockchain and they think, oh, that's Bitcoin, that's crypto, that's, and, and in fact, Really, that crypto is just one small application of blockchain. We're not even doing anything in DeFi right now. We, we will, that will come. But, but right now we've got so much work in supply chain, asset track and trace, information management, that you know it's, that's a trillion dollar space by itself. So these are real life applications that are gonna live on top of your chain at this point from the large ERP systems and major Fortune 100 companies. And yeah, I can give you a great, a great idea of how that works. You know, Boeing has 400 suppliers that they are trying to wrangle around the F-18 fighter and its parts. We took all of those 400 suppliers and data points, put them in the blockchain. They were trying to connect ERP systems together, which frankly was a dumpster fire. I mean, it's so hard to do. I mean, you can, you can imagine a sub-tier supplier saying to Boeing, I'm not sharing my data with you, mm -hmm. right? You'll just crush me. But in the blockchain, they can pick and choose exactly what they want to put there. You have full immutability, you have full permanence, full verifiability. And so they just put in what they needed. It's great whenever you have a consortium of development partners that need to work together. Blockchain is a wonderful solution. Do you see any trends in the blockchain technology at this point? Yeah, I do. Uh, I see, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of work going on right now about uh, speed about how quickly you can write and read from the blockchain. I mean, you probably just saw the big uh, transformation with Ethereum going to Ethereum 2.0 was all yes. about um, sustainability and green, right? I mean, there's been all this challenge with blockchain, like, oh, it's very costly from an environmental standpoint and from a, an energy standpoint. There's a lot of technology and change now going on that's, that's going to make that really accessible and very green. And that's happening. Speed is going up. Um, and I think you're just going to find a lot of, uh, of companies like ours that are going to make it easier and easier to get on and use the blockchain. I think it's going to be a transformational technology for sure. That's exciting because the cost to use the blockchain is going to decrease then. It is. That so that's a substantial upside. 
especially when you look at the volume of transactions, which will be billions of transactions that'll live on totally. your chain. And to give you an idea where in early days, Ethereum was like $18 up to $100 in gas fees for transaction. Yeah. Those are down now to sub one cent. And okay. the number of transactions per second are now in the tens of thousands. So it's going to continue to grow and get better and better. Explain fuel uh, fees to our listeners at this point. They, some may be familiar, some may probably are not. Yeah. So there is a cost to all of that uh, verifiability and and permanence and provenance. And what you're doing is paying people to validate this decentralized network. Mm -hmm. And so there's a small cost that's associated. Now in the past, it wasn't so small, but it's getting increasingly small as the size of the transactions go up. But basically what you're doing is you're sending a payment to a network, mm -hmm. which then distributes that payment based on their involvement to validate and verify what's happening on the blockchain. That's where you get your trustless consensus mechanism um, that makes the blockchain work. So those costs uh, perform a real a real task, but uh, th those are going down dramatically and the performance is going up. I think that's what makes this all workable. Yeah, exactly. People like yourself and the bright individuals living in that ecosystem that recognized we've got to keep this reasonable, open, and trust is the most important part of it. And we're yeah. moving in a very strong position and it, it's accelerating on the acceptance level. Yeah. Perfect. And that's what I enjoy. Is there anything I haven't touched on that you would like to add? Yeah, we touched on a lot of it, but I would just emphasize that I think sometimes corporations are saying, oh, it's, you know, blockchain, crypto, it's not really for me. In fact, I was talking to a large Fortune 100 the other day that said, yeah, we're keeping our eye on crypto. And I mean, I said, you mean blockchain? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, blockchain, but we're not really sure it has a real need for us. And I'm like, well, if you don't think blockchain has a real need for you, you've not looked at it hard enough. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think what's gonna happen like anything, this is gonna be one of those technologies that provides real competitive advantage and real, ins and real opportunities to, um, to improve business processes that in the past may have been problematic. Uh, so I would just say that to all of your listeners that, you know, keep an eye on this and really understand it from the broader blockchain distributed ledger technology perspective, not from just the crypto perspective. Remember the crypto, our listeners, is living on top of the blockchain. Correct. The blockchain is the platform that allows those transactions to take place, but it also allows purchase orders to move from one location to another. It allows for the inventory accessibility that's available inside a warehouse is living on the blockchain. So the foundation of it is the blockchain. What you do with the blockchain above it on the next layer above it, which is the software site layer, that changes based on that's the application. True. That's well new. said. Yeah, very well said. So, how can our listeners contact you? And are there any links you'd like to share? Yeah, I'd love to have them go out to our website uh, at simbachain.com. In fact, we have a webinar coming up here soon uh, that can really explain how you can use Web3 to solve real-world business solution problems. So if you'd like to get out and do that off our webpage, and if you want to send me an email directly, I'm just at bkr at simbachain.com. Love to hear from you. Spell Simba for our listeners. Yeah, it's just like the lion cub, S-I-M-B-A, and then chain. So simbachain.com. Excellent. Addressing an important topic as 95% of founders don't know how to sell their companies. I've co-founded with a global team at the Hyper Accelerator, a new market leading mergers and acquisition accelerator program to help our founders prepare to sell or merge their companies within a hundred day global virtual accelerator program. The M&A Hyper Accelerator will prepare portfolio companies to be acquired and maximize their exit value, integration, in life post-sale. You can learn more about the program at startupcourse.com and click on the M&A application. Again, that visit startupcourse.com and click on the M&A application. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. You have simplified the complex topic of the blockchain technologies and our listeners will walk away with a better understanding. I wanna thank you for sharing your expertise and your vision with us. I know you're gonna be doing your B raise at this point. So our listeners, uh, they're a tremendous organization, brilliant. Uh, you could see some of the companies I have written checks and I'm an investor in needs his solution because we're on multiple chains at this point and we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this. <laughs> right. And Simba technology allows that to happen very simple. 
And that simplicity is the magic to be able to do things intelligently, repeatedly, and with a high level of not just trust, but validation and really understanding that the data is secure and it's global. Yeah. I want to thank our listeners. I look forward to being back with you shortly for another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. The show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC.